Should we just quickly go through the films that we have actually done together from yeah. the beginning? Yeah, see if we can remember. Well, the first one was The Reader. Did we then do A Little Chaos together or had we done something in between? Oh, we must have no, done something I in between. Think... Oh my God, we're rubbish, aren't we? We've like no, we're said we're going to reel all this. It's all right, they can cut this part out if we can't remember it. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Kate Winslet and welcome to The Process. And today, um, Ivana Primorak, hair and makeup designer, um, who I've been fortunate enough to work with many times over the last 14 years of my life. We're here sharing our stories of how we collaborated and put together the look and the feel for the character of Mayor Sheehan in Mayor of Easttown. So welcome Ivana, hi. Hi, <laughs> nice to be here. Oh God, it's brilliant. So, um, well, this is quite an unusual situation really because you and I have never had an opportunity like this one where we can talk on a forum like this that will go online about the process of putting together a character and how, and how that breaks down and what that looks like in terms of the, the thought process in the prep and the emotional components that come into play when figuring out who a character might be, how they carry themselves, the age of them, the sort of emotional weight of them in particular, the emotional weight of Mare and everything that she carries. So, so over to you, first of all, let's just, um, let's just start talking about how that process began for you. You know, you sit down on day one of your prep. And, and how does that look for you? What do, what do you do? Um, well, very, very good question. And it's also a brilliant question to answer, having been through many different uh, projects with you in particularly. Um, every single one of them is different, um, but particularly Mayor of Easttown was very, very different. And the reason being is there is a television show which was um, seven episodes, so the, there's a there's a there's a there's a journey ahead, um, which is not uh, the same as when you're doing 120 pages of a feature film. So there lie many many clues on what your process uh, will be and might be. Um, so with Mayor of Easttown, I mean, I did. I was very lucky that you said it's absolutely brilliant, but you didn't tell me anything else about it. Um, and I thought, okay, well, how brilliant can it be? Um, and I read it and read it all in one sitting, but I did not, um, like most people, didn't get a chance to read the, the episode seven uh, for very, very obvious reasons. Um, but I didn't need to read episode seven whatsoever. It was absolutely um, most brilliant writing and most brilliant uh, piece. I really wanted to be a part of trying to assemble this character. But unlike all the other characters that we had to assemble together and come to um, come to uh, uh, create together, yeah, and I think with something like the reader, for example, you know, we we had to be really specific with the look of that character because she aged so many years, and so then we did have things like prosthetics to play around with, and a change of of wig and color to play around with, and the eyes. We even added contact lenses for that character as she got older. But with Mare, our you know our shared intention was to put together a person who just looked like a woman going through life like everyone else, like most people, dealing with the weight of those daily struggles and challenges that she faced. And, and that process of like, let's talk about how we came up with the hair, because that is quite interesting, I think. Well, she had to, she had to blend into the world that we actually, that exists, that we know. And, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I've been to Philadelphia before. So that part of the world was not alien to me. But it was very important that she does not in any way look um, um, not real, that she looks like people who go through um, their life in those parts of the world, uh, which are not very easy. They're not easy for very many different um, reasons. Uh, um, and Mary is faced with them all being uh, because of her job. So suddenly we have um, uh, someone who works as a detective at the police station 
um, we know her age and we know what she's been through um, in her past life. So suddenly we learn at some point in, in I think episode three, we learn a lot more about her past. I think it was very interesting. We met very, very, very early on. I think it was April. Yeah, we started filming. We started filming in October of 2019. So yes, in the April of that year, right after Ammonite, actually, because we did Ammonite together. Oh, we did actually, Ammonite we, together. Do you remember how we already started a little bit to think trying about, to yeah. stop ourselves talking about Mare too much whilst yes. we were still doing Ammonite? Um, but yeah, you're right. It was April of 2019. We started really digging into the the sort of a, a broad strokes of what Mare might look like. There were certain things that were important to you. Uh, for example, that, you know, anything that looks um, stylish and manicured like your eyebrows wouldn't be that for her because mm -hmm. she doesn't, she d just doesn't pluck her eyebrows. So there were certain guidelines that we touched on, um, like, well, let's undo all the things that might naturally look done on me naturally. Um, and, and your eyebrows are particularly that. So... They're just like that. I got them from my mother. So <laughs> they've always been like that. So, so to me, that was something that might look like, it might look like the minute you put a little bit of mascara on or you put a little bit of concealer on, you immediately could look nice. And it's not about not looking nice. It's about feeling the tiredness and the, and, and, and the lack of sleep and, and the worry that Mare went through every single day of her life. And I think that had to show more than thinking about how good or bad she looks. It wasn't that she needed to look bad. She couldn't look like she, she had to wear all of those things on her, on her persona. We had to think that she's exhausted at all times because she was. Yeah, and, and well, as you, as you know better than anybody, a little bit of makeup in terms of things like mascara or even a lip liner can go a very, very long way. And it does a great deal to just open up the face and if you put some mascara on or you put some foundation on suddenly that becomes a person who has the time to think about how she looks each day and our I think our sort of mo was Mare looks in the mirror when she brushes her teeth in the morning and scrapes her hair back in that same damn manageable ponytail every every day and that's it and then she doesn't look in the mirror again until she goes to bed at night so that sort of naked translucent totally clear face so that all you see is the marks of her life as opposed to the face she's applying on top of it by way of any kind of makeup and and I do remember us talking quite a lot about how how willing I would be to let my little sunspots show which actually even for this interview I've gone ahead and covered up you know I have a couple up here I have some around my cheeks that are quite pigmented now and just letting those things absolutely show, you know, really playing into my own natural aging now at the age of 45 and not covering up or, or sort of highlighting over, you know, what people might call problem areas. I personally love them myself, but the wrinkles around here, the shadowy under the eye, just leaving all of that alone and adding as you brilliantly had the idea to add a little bit of um, eyebrow at the outer corners here, just to just to give it the whole uh, eye shape, just that slightly heavier, broken down look. Made it was a tiny thing, but made a really big difference. Keeping my 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 lips totally naked, so there's never any definition of shape, all that stuff, and and also we didn't have any sort of powder or things, so the skin really always looked like looked yeah. like skin and. And we wanted, I remember us saying over and over again, we, ha we have to be ruthless with ourselves. We mustn't yeah. get sucked into covering up spots or, you know, erasing things just for the sake of television. And just because that's what we're all trained to do with actors, you know, trained to make us all look good. Yeah, and blocking the, the natural skin. You know, the minute you put a finest, finest layer of foundation on, it looks nice. Um, yeah. And so, and also we didn't really moisturize as much as you normally would. It would, Correct. Also, but then your dry lips and your dry corner of the eyes developed more and more as the months went on and your yeah. smile lines and everything became just slightly crepier because moisturizers do work. So we That's stopped right. all that regime that men didn't have access to. 
So yep. Kate didn't really get to do things that uh, May wouldn't. And that really, I think, helped the whole of the, you know, creation of, of, of a person who you can tell what she was going through from scene to scene. And I have to say, thousands of people across the globe, I meaning not many people, you know, you mentioned how many jobs I've done, but not many people have reacted, um, not as many people have reacted to, to anything I've done before as they have to Mare, because it touched everyone how real she was. I understand, but I'm a detective sergeant, which means I investigate the burglaries and the overdoses and all the really bad crap that goes on around here. Sounds awful. Maybe you should look into a different line of work. Here it is, Mrs. Carroll. See this? That's the main station number. All right, that's the one you want. I'll put it right in the center. So you call them, okay, next time, instead of waking me up. Let's just talk about the hair for a minute, the wig, because it was a wig and a lot of people might not know that. Um, and it was brilliantly done by you and the process of wrapping my hair very tightly underneath and creating that, tr that translucent parting so that when you see skin through the central part, much like my hair looks a lot like Mare's actual hair right now because I haven't had my colour done for months. Um, but that you see that skin through and, and, and that those brilliant things that... Uh, that you have over the years created that um, that really make the wigs just look like hair. So that process of deciding that Mare would have a good three inches of regrowth, I mean, that, that came as, again, from our very early conversations about, well, you know, most women in, 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 their, in their late 30s, mid 40s, do color their hair, whether it's for vanity reasons or covering up gray or whatever it might be. It's just a, standard thing that that people do so i think we decided that at, at one point mayor probably colored her hair quite a lot but then after the time that her son kevin died and given that he he died about 22 months before our story actually begins we decided that at that point she just gave up everything couldn't be not couldn't be bothered but had no inclination whatsoever to take care of her feminine self abandoning all sense of femininity um, any sense of vanity and um, or airs of any any kind and so showing that regrowth actually is almost our way of showing the passing of time and the depth of her grief yes and in the flashback in episode six when Mare is with the grief therapist and she talks about what happened on the day that Kevin actually died we have the freshly coloured, much blonder and actually slightly longer wig for those scenes. But talk about those conversations and how we try different lengths of wig and yeah. colours and so on. Well, I do, I do remember very, very early on that you did have, you had the idea. I mean, first of all, it was very important for me to be guided by what you thought of her because she could literally have looked like anyone because there was no period it was modern day, period gives you a, um, a parameter, it gives you a language, it gives you some sort of guideline where to go. We didn't have any of that. So having you guide us both was very, very important because you, you had such a strong feeling about her, but of course we didn't know what that feeling was. And you did come up with the idea that she wouldn't suddenly be coloring her hair if she, because everyone colors their hair. And I think you and I very early on looked at some images from the um, uh, real people in the police force. And, and as anywhere today, people do color their hair a lot. And I do remember you saying, you know, that, that if she stopped coloring her hair, she'll have a bit of a root. And that was suddenly, that was the springboard to the idea that, okay, if she did stop coloring her hair, how long has it been? This could be, this could be, an amazing clue that people wouldn't get till we discover that scene, till she talks about when Kevin died. And then of course people go, oh my God, it's been that long. And that is, everyone knows hair grows one inch a month in, uh, about that. So, and that is a really difficult, very difficult regrowth. That regrowth yeah. tells you that people, it just a person doesn't have any time yeah. for themselves. And yeah, that's and they just let go. So that was then I added that little bit to it. And I think you were like, okay, my God, let's try it. And that's the first fitting that we staged together 
Um, yeah. We tried that. But also I did think that it would be amazing to have the ability to, when you pull your hair back, is mainly brown. If you let it out, it can also have some blonde around your face. So you get, you, you may could have a little bit of a moment, uh, especially on a maybe occasional date or something to, to try. But of course it never really quite works because of what happens in the conversation with, with the Richard or whoever, or whatever happens in her life, the brown prevails. <laughs> so blonde is not really that important, but it gave us a little bit of a light and shade of a situation. And lots of people again told me how much they enjoyed seeing, imagining what she could have been like if she was not going through what she was going through. And I think that added a little bit of uh, history to people in their own mind. They created their own, their own mare. Uh, which I think is wonderful when we can do that with the way we make actors, uh, characters look. We give backstory to, um, to, to, to the viewer. And I think that's definitely been the case with Mayor and I can't believe we've had so much response to that. You know, seemingly very simple hairstyle, never changing. Yeah. But I think that idea to measure the time um, and making it so difficult um, on the face uh, yeah. gave it credibility. And do you remember as well, Ivana, that, you know, in our early conversations, we would say, now, how are we going to make me look different? And we even experimented with sort of texture, textured makeup here to add even more crepiness. And we ultimately decided that no matter how well we could be at doing those things that little by little it almost looked like just too much so with the yeah. regrowth in the hair and the bit of eyebrow the naked face that was that ended up being enough but do you remember that we also experimented with changing my eye color yes do you remember so yeah. we tried we tried about four different eye colors didn't we at one point yeah. we, had, we had there were colored contact lenses and we tried a really lovely green that i remember thinking was yeah. great just making her look like that sort of Irish Catholic heritage. Yes, um, and red and we hair, tried, we tried red yes. hair. We tried a very sort of um, really rich brunette colour, but it looked too, it almost looked too healthy or something. Yeah, and I think that your idea to go to unkempt colour came from trying different hair colours. We try, I think we tried every single natural hair colour. And, yeah. and we also just, tried short. Do you remember we tried very yes. short hair looks as well? Yeah. That was really interesting. It's so funny when I look at the photographs that we took of those initial early fittings, I'm just like, oh my God, it so isn't Mare at all. <laughs> that process yeah. of how we came to decide on what she would feel like and look like was was actually quite lengthy in the end, wasn't it? It was really lengthy. It was the longest we ever had for any character. And, and it was more complicated than any other character. And I would say... It's because when you try short, it looks great. But then you arrive to a thought, why would she have gone to cut it? Then you know, there was never any reason, we couldn't find the reason why she would go to any of those lengths. Why, if she has this incredibly long, beautiful brunette hair, that's her main, that's her strength. That's it. And we would say over and over again, we'd say if we gave her that hair, she'd have to be managing it. And yes. so making that decision to just do something that is, is like most of us, you throw it back, you go. I mean, I never even touch a hairdryer because I don't have time, you know? Why do they call you Lady Hawk? Mm. I made a shot in a, in a basketball game, that, that basketball game, 25 years ago. Okay, must have been some shot. Most places, no. Around here, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Ivana, let's just take a minute, step away from there. And people probably don't know this about you, but you are not English originally. You were born and raised in Croatia. Yes. And I just would love you to take this moment to share with everyone what was your creative journey into the world of becoming a hair and makeup artist because i also know as you've told me many times that you love children and that you were a child nanny for a long time before you yeah. became a hair and makeup yeah. artist so 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 yeah. so t tell us about that well i come from a very academic family then um in former yugoslavia and um and my mum and dad always uh took us to theater cinema and opera and everywhere 
Um, so I, I come from a family that cherishes all things artistic, but none of them are in the arts. They're lawyers and judges, which in Yugoslavia didn't really mean much apart from um, a lot of knowledge and a lot of compassion towards other art forms, really. Um, so as I wasn't really academic and didn't really want to go to university, which was the only option, I started to think, what on earth can I do? And that was, I'm going to relieve, reveal how old I am now. That was a time when Dustin Hoffman starred in every single great movie uh, from Tootsie to Papillon to anything. And I was like, who on earth is this? Who does this job? Who could turn Dustin Hoffman into um, a prisoner in Papillon and Tootsie the next day? I mean, it, it was phenomenal. So I uh, researched it a little bit and I found there is a job, there is a job and the BBC trained people in London. Um, and I was so far away from London and I was thinking if I don't give this a go, I'm gonna have to be a lawyer's assistant or a receptionist or what am I gonna do because I'm not really academic. I don't really wanna study. So I found out, I called the BBC and they said, yes, there is a training program and you have to do all these different things, which took three years for me to complete. But my mum and dad let me go to London and try and uh, complete uh, a course at the BBC. Um, the story gets really quite complicated from that moment on because it takes so long for all these different interviews. Basically 6,000 people get narrowed down to last seven. And they, in the end, they made a mistake. They sent me a letter to say I did get into the training program and then called them the next day and said, it was someone else we wanted. It's not you. And I thought- Oh my God, you've never, ever told me that. That's unbelievable. It's an absolute disaster. But I then, I thought, I can't let this stop me. I can't, I can't let this stop me. So I got a job at Screenface, which was an amazing makeup shop in, in uh, West Bond Grove. And in that makeup shop, uh, all the BBC, all the makeup artists would, you know, come and, and buy their stuff. And Eileen Mayer, who was then a head of the BBC makeup, came in and said, you are the girl. I remember you. You are the girl that we had to call to say you didn't get in. So it was very much acknowledged. And, and they were, everyone was very supportive. And I decided that I'm just going to do what BBC was going to do for me uh, by myself. But luckily as well, at that time, BBC kind of, disbanded uh, the program stopped and not many there was not another school after mine so maybe that was easier for me but yes I had to I suddenly thought what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and be a nanny for a year to save money for uh, further education and another course and I'm going to write to every single makeup artist that I know and wrote to Naomi Don who is an amazing makeup artist and uh, um, still a friend and she read my CV and said, oh, my God, she she speaks Croatian. I have to get her in. And uh, and she got me in as a trainee. And that was my beginning. So it, it was very it was difficult, um, but I was determined. I didn't know if I was going to be any good. And so it was really quite refreshing to hear from people that, yes, I was learning and that I was, you know, uh, there was hope. And that kept me going. And um, it took me a long, long, long time to train up, but then it would have to be a lawyer. So I took exactly the same time to educate myself in makeup and hair as I would have being a doctor, a lawyer, about 10 years. And would you, what projects would you say in your career was, was a big turning point project for you that really sort of launched you into the much sort of higher category of hair and makeup designers? Well, it has to be, it has to be, because it took so long for me to train up to be uh, like a senior makeup and hair artist. I was asked to do Billy Elliot um, as one of my, my second design job, as it were, as a head of department. And by doing that job, not only I met Stephen Daldry and got to do the hours, but I also met Anne Roth. Um, who Anne Roth is a costume designer. Costume designer. Um, and Anne Roth insisted I come and work on Cold Mountain. And I think that was really a project that launched me into another level. And, and meeting Scott Rudin with Anne Roth uh, gave me opportunities to work on some really amazing projects. 
My God, isn't it amazing? You know, these things. That, and also, as you go through life, you you sort of pick up on the rhythms of other creatives, don't you? So, for example, Stephen Daldry, who we both worked together on The Reader um, with Stephen, he, he has such a sort of constantly evolving creative process. He's never strictly set in his vision in terms of how a room should look, how a character should feel, how the costume should be, or how the hair should look. And so I think, I mean, I learned a lot through working with Stephen because he's so willing to hear everyone's ideas. And, and that's what really gives us, I think, the skills to be able to collaborate. And that's mm -hmm. helped you and I a lot, yes. I think, particularly with Ammonite, but but more importantly with with Mare, because we had to always be talking the same language and and we had to absolutely have the same narrative in our heads about who she was and what she had been through. And and it's interesting, yeah. isn't it, how you you really do learn that process on the job in spite of all of your training. Actually, it's the job and the life experience that comes with that that yeah. really gives us the skills that we ultimately have. And, and it is the fear of, of uh, caring so much that, you, that I won't be able to deliver this time that makes us maybe work a bit harder. I don't know, but I always, about Mayor, I had real fear because the responsibility to the viewer um, was huge. You know, I felt that, you know, they, they needed to completely believe and trust um, this person. Uh, this person not being Kate, it had to be, you had to be transformed into mayor more so, I would say, than other people to give you a chance to be able to tell the story over such a long period of time. It is, it, it, Ammonite was very difficult for different reasons, but it was, it was, we had sort of, we had some rules and parameters of the period. And mm. so not having a lot of makeup on, uh, uh, giving her hair that's not very nice, thinning and thin and not glamorous and slightly greasy, that was kind of enough. And I felt that nuances of mare were very quite difficult. And that's why it took us so long. And, and the amount of hair we put into the wigs and the amount of eyebrows we put on, um, the amount of you know shading in your cheeks sometimes that to make you look more tired. Uh, we did a lot of eye bags, you know, a lot of yeah. eye bag painting. Um, yes, we did. Yeah. And that, you know, with translucent, different translucent gels and stuff to make you look quite tired and, and, and exhausted. Never, never, you know, always tell, trying to tell a story of what's going on inside of her uh, uh, was our task. And I think that's, that's what it was so difficult. And I, it, I did find it, I did think, oh my God, what if I don't find her? What if I, and of course, the only saving grace is that I knew I have you to work with who would help. <laughs> but it is scary because it is a huge, I think it's a huge task. I don't think if we failed to deliver any of those things, I don't think she would have had so much impact from opening opening credits, opening shot when we meet her. Yeah. And do you remember as well that I, I, I certainly recall this very clearly, that we would over and over again, we'd say, <clears throat> it doesn't matter what we end up having Mare look like. We have to start from a place of integrity and truthfulness within the character. But also we had to take on board the fact that audiences who have seen things that I am in have been more used to seeing me pulled together, perhaps with hair that is done, certainly some makeup on, often lipstick, you know, playing characters who have the time to care about how they look. So we had to, we had the to get- The dressmaker, the dressmaker. I remember another one. The dressmaker one. in That's Australia. Wonderful. Yeah, very wonderful stylized, makeup. manicured, set in the fifties. And that was a, yeah, I mean, that was a very specific, look that took a long time in terms of the prep and getting ready in the morning and so on but we had to break down right away the any preconceived ideas the audiences had of how they are used to seeing me on screen and for me as well how they're used to perhaps hearing me on screen so so it was everything you know yes the dialect has been much talked about but that was just one part of all the different components of making mayor just 
just this woman so so that you don't see any of that other stuff hopefully getting rid of audiences preconceived ideas of what i have looked like in the past what i have sounded like before now and even moving beyond my own relatively articulate speaking voice i just we, we do you remember how we would say my god we've got to get it right in episode one right away <laughs> We can't like we would be like we can't fuck around. No, <laughs> like, and you can't this right. be, yeah, and you can't you can't because it would be hard to be believed with the first opening shot, and and that's quite a hard task. But at the same time, you know, it's not about giving someone greasy hair like we did in Ammonite. You know, it's it's the believability of measuring it right so that Mary's pretty unnoticeable in her surroundings in those streets that we so, you know, grew, grew to love, you know, that we filmed in, but it's a tough, they're tough neighborhoods, they're tough people's stories, and she lives amongst them. The thing is, we don't know anything after a year. Thanks for being in my corner. Sit down, Mayor. The Rotary Club increased the reward money to $15,000. we are printing up new flyers and handing them out at every needle exchange from Camden to Wilmington. Go back to the file. We're starting over here. T talk about how you, how you collaborated with, with Debbie and Shanika, our, <clears throat> our other yes. department heads who worked with other actors. How was that collaborative process in terms of unifying the look of all the characters, Mare amongst them? What were those conversations like with, with them when you were establishing how, these, how this community would look? Yes, I mean, we started first. Uh, so we established, we were going uh, a certain way already. And I think that gave um, Debbie and Shanika um, a pretty good idea that we were very serious about this and there was not going to be any slight heightedness just because you're in more than any other actor you know your 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 days at work will weigh um, more than any other character so sometimes in in other projects you can see that those people look slightly more heightened and better you know when when they realize that none of this is going on in this I think they were very very um, they're very keen to undo anything that is um, that goes against uh, creating the look in that community. And that was very refreshing that they were really inspired by us, I would say, uh, once they saw what we were doing and how we were doing and how little we were doing. Um, and also some days, I mean, I have to mention that part of your process is that you will sit there applying three dots of makeup uh, um, as Mayor would in, in her real life where I was doing a hair prep. And so our routine became also quite real because that is her, you know? And then I could add an eye bag or two and an eyebrow and everything, but it became, it became creating her, beca became a, a, a particular process. And I think they uh, were inspired by it and wanted to carry on creating that community to its truest form. So people looked, nice but real they didn't look like they've been to hairdressers they didn't you know the younger the younger um, members of the cast who could form um another kind of layer to it all of course had a certain layer of modern uh, modernity to it or or whatever might be in at the moment and that was also quite nice because you could tell who's who who is into what music so that also created a wonderful world that you can get a clue which kid is like what. And then when all the intrigue and problems happen between them, you can realize why they liked or didn't like each other. Um, all those young people were styled brilliantly by Shanika and Debbie particularly, because you could really see what they're all into and how they all live together. So, um, yeah, we worked, collaborated amazingly together, but I do have to say that you inspired them very much so as a leader in this whole reality um, of style, the reality of style. And that's a that's a that's a really um, that's a really lovely thing for you to say, and and also for me to hear because because I I was aware that you know being sort of cast number one as they would call it on the call sheet. Um, 
you know, it, it is, I, I take that as a really big compliment, responsibility and duty to set the tone yeah. amongst everyone. And, and we really had that on there. It was very important to me as cast number one, but also as a producer that yes. we created a sense of balance and equality amongst all of our actors. So everyone was treated the same. Everyone, we were all in those same size, small, funny trailers. <laughs> Do you yeah. remember how you and I would often be doing, we would be doing a costume and hair and makeup change, going from in you know a, something in episode one to a look yeah. in episode six within the same yeah. night of film shooting. And we would literally be changing with a head torch underneath the bridge with rats scurrying around under our legs, not knowing what we were treading on. And yeah. it was the same for everybody. And we made sure yeah. that that was the case. Yeah. And part of that was not just because for myself, it's very important that there's no hierarchy. It was also because we wanted to create this sense of real community amongst our actors, particularly our young actors who are wanting to learn and therefore quite vulnerable at times and also really impressionable. And I wanted to make sure that the impression that they had of working at this quite high level, intense level of work, you know, you had to be on your A game, ready, prepared and absolutely eager to jump in with both feet first and and could change at the last minute because things do change depending on the weather depending on whether you're behind you get ahead with something suddenly you might find yourself shooting a scene that's not planned until the following week and come on let's go 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 we can do it um so i think setting that tone of sort of hamsters in a wheel and everyone running at the same pace wearing the same clothes with the same sort of a treatment with the same attitude and energy it was very important to me to maintain that tone that was set early on. And, and I do think that we all did that together across the departments, the hair and makeup and costume, Megan Kasperlik, our extraordinary costume designer, um, and her department as well. We all just fell into this real community effort to keep everything profoundly real and, um, and I think, integral and grounded in the place that it is set and where it's from and so what then happened was that of course all the actors particularly the younger ones started to feel comfortable and included and um and and, and more confident too and i think when you're a young actor you know you're so nervous in those early jobs that actually when you do see older perhaps more experienced actors around you setting a tone just getting on with the job no fuss no bells and whistles it sort of it sort of helps for the insecurities in them to just evaporate and go away so then everybody is just given a space to be able to hopefully excel in their jobs and really just do their best and and be part of something hopefully you know unique and and special and uh and we were all so supported by that brilliant script written by Brad Inglesby, yeah. And, and the green room, the green rooms were always a bunch of chairs in a circle and actors sitting in them chatting. And the yeah. makeup and hair checks were minimal. They were literally a mirror in front of you and a tissue, blow your nose, you know, set the hair so it's like if right for continuity, but not for nothing else. And no one looked in the mirror, no one had a trailer, no one took more than 10 minutes to be ready. And so what you do see and people talk about it all the time about you know uh, clothes which are not brilliantly fitted because they're real. Uh, and but the but the chemistry between you and your mom and you and your daughter and all the different families and everything is extraordinary. And people talk about it, but that took a lot of effort to say no to certain things that maybe are or has become a norm when you do different television programs and when you make stories about real people, they're never really quite real people. You wanted to make this about the real community. We know where it is, we filmed in it. So I feel yeah. very, very um, proud that I kind of learned something new about how to do that because I really truly didn't know how to do that because it's, it's actually it's simplifying everything to that extent, not to even have a trailer means the look, it does add, everything adds to the look because you can't keep up. There's nothing, there's no makeup to check. There is no eyebrow to pluck because you're adding more unplucked eyebrows. There is no hair to 
uh, uh, use electrical equipment on because you just have it in the ponytail. I do remember sometimes you, if you'd come up to me <clears throat> to sort of check me between scenes and often you would be actually just kind of going set. I yes. would be just like yes. a bit of, it would be all about undoing the hair as opposed to doing it back. It would be all about making sure these bits were, you know, messy like they were because they were windblown or because I'd gone like this, being able to really touch the hair, put the hands in the hair as we were able to truly do. And those are things as well that, that, that keep it connected to a sense of reality, a sense of yeah. just real life. And there were times when I'd walk up and um, walk up and look at you and go, oh no. And it was became funny because it was sad to see her so sad. And and so, um, but you know, it meant a lot when, um, uh, you know, lots of people like your lovely uh, police detective who was helping with, you know, when- Christine when she, Blayler, yes. The lovely Christine always always paid a compliment on that saying that's what she she wouldn't have had time her badge in the back pocket her jacket on eating in the car that's her life and you know it is in film terms it is quite complicated to find and define that character in film terms in continuity terms in in making it as easy you know technically so you could go into the water and be on the other side of the river from your costume and makeup team uh, in, because you had to be and uh, there was no warm nothing there was no warm tent yeah. there was nothing but that's how real it was and she was very christine was very complimentary but yeah. i do always say when people compliment the show i always say oh my god do you have no idea how hard it was to do yeah. it was hard because it was it was very hard but yeah. it was so, and I do feel like I've learned so much. I learned another, I've learned another skill. I mean, I felt like I really learned an enormous amount as well. And, and also for me, for me as, a, as, as an actress, playing a role like that for such a long period of time, because it turned into over a year of actual filming due to COVID, um, you know, becoming so immersed and so deeply embedded in who that car character was with the marks and the flaws and the scars in her, you know, it, 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 it just sort of taught me a lesson in, in really, really being unselfconscious, really letting all of that stuff go. Um, because as an actor, you know, you'll often say, oh, it's gonna be no makeup, but you still end up doing a sort of no makeup, but makeup look, but we really had, no makeup you know we, we we really did commit to that and I feel very proud of that and I you know I hope that has been inspiring to people um because you know that's what it's about that's what yeah. that's what acting is about is 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 trying to be as unselfconscious as yeah. you can and as real as you can well thank you so much Ivana this has been a conversation with Ivana Primorak for the process Thanks for listening. And Ivana, I can't wait to see you at the Emmys. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you so see much. See you then.